Hey everyone, good morning. This is Mike Beam. Uh, I have the pleasure of serving uh, as the Secretary of Agriculture for Kansas. I wanna personally welcome you to this portion of the sixth annual Gross Summit. And although we are back to getting together for the summit uh, on, and it'll be on August 26th, we chose to continue with our sector breakouts to be done in a uh, virtual session. And that will uh, primarily so more people can participate uh, ahead of the actual summit. And again, the, the purpose of this, uh, and to, this morning we'll look at our feed and forage sectors, but the purpose is to identify uh, strategies or challenges that face this, these sectors and see if, you know, what's the appropriate steps for the state agency or other cooperators that, that we work with to address those, uh, those needs. So I wanna thank you for taking part in this session. I encourage you to participate uh, by chat or uh, other means in which uh, our staff will direct you as we get through this session. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Kim, uh, let her introduce herself and kick off the rest of the program. Kim? Thank you, Secretary Beam. Um, I'm Kim Nettleton and I'm with the Kansas Department of Agriculture, the Division of Agricultural Marketing uh, here in Manhattan. And we are so glad that you have chosen to spend your time online with us this morning. Uh, we will be focusing for the next hour and a half on the Kansas feed and forage sector. Um, the feed and forage sector, as I'm sure you are all aware, uh, is a very important sector of the state's agricultural economy. <clears throat> According to estimates prepared by the Kansas Department of Agriculture and based on the in-plan economic data model, the estimated direct impact of the forage industry uh, is $250.4 million uh, in input. And that's about, that equates to about 5,998 jobs. And then including indirect and induced effects, that total impact of the industry on Kansas economy reaches $445.9 million in output and 7,179 jobs. So that's quite significant. Key Kansas forage production statistics include second in sorghum silage production, which is, uh, makes us 28.8% of the US total. Um, sorghum silage production is currently 900,000 tons, which is 18% of the corn silage production. Fifth in all hay production, um, 5.89 million tons is produced here, and that is 4.6% of the US total. We are 13th in feeds and fodder exports uh, at $145.5 million. And corn silage production as of 2018 is 4.9 million tons, which is 3.5% of the US total. So we are, we are a force to be reckoned with. The vision of our agency is to provide an ideal environment for long-term sustainable agricultural prosperity and statewide economic growth. Our summit sector sessions provide the platform to help entertain opportunities and barriers to agricultural growth, uh, uh, agricultural industry growth here in the state. So with that, we'll get started, but I have a couple of housekeeping items that I need to take care of. Many of us are Zoom meeting professionals by now, we're old hands at this. But I would like to review a, a couple of quick housekeeping items before the session begins. Um, first, during the presentation portions of this session, uh, all participant microphones will be muted by the meeting host. Uh, if you have a question during the presentation, please submit your question using uh, the chat button at the bottom of your screen. The host will grant permission to unmute your microphone after the presentation portion of the session, and we encourage everyone to contribute to this discussion uh, because our industry can't grow without you. At any time during the section, uh, the session when you're asking a question, 
Uh, please include your name, city, and organization if that's applicable. And lastly, this session is being recorded and will be posted um, online. So with that, uh, I would like to introduce Mark Nelson. He is the Director of Commodities with the Kansas Farm Bureau, and he also serves as the Executive Secretary for the Kansas Forge and Grassland Council. Mark has graciously agreed to serve as our moderator today. I want to thank you, Mark, so much for your help on this. And with that, I will turn it over to him. All right. Uh, thank you, Kim. Thank you very much. That was very kind. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as Secretary Beam mentioned, this is our sixth Governor's Ag Growth Summit. And with each, the Feed and Forge Group has examined the industry. Uh, we've noted the opportunities, and we've worked to prioritize the challenges holding us back. Um, uh, holding us back. Now, this is, list of challenges that we create each year, though, is, is more than just an inventory of problems. Uh, it should be viewed as a to-do list for all of us in, in the Kansas feed and forage sector, whether we're farmers, ranchers, part of a business or agency or members of associations. We all need to be thinking of how we can help surmount these challenges. Uh, and, and, you know, we've really made uh, progress. Uh, we now have an alfalfa seed checkoff, adding to the funds available for research and education. Uh, KSU Research and Extension, along with the Kansas Forage and Grassland Council, will have combined to put together an alfalfa variety test. Uh, NRCS and the Kansas Grazing Lands Council uh, sponsor grazing workshops all across the state. Working with K-State as an industry, all of us together, we were able to ensure that a forage-focused extension specialist was hired as a Southeast Area agronomist. Uh, hello, Bruno. Thank you for being here. And while there have been more, the last success I, I wanna mention this morning is, is that as an industry, we've been able to attract a major forage conference to Kansas as the 2022 American Forage and Grassland Conference will be held in Wichita, Kansas, January 9th through the 12th, 2022. Uh, please mark those dates on your calendars, January 9th through the 12th, 2020, uh, 2022. Workshop sections will include winter feed, feeding management, grazing cover crops and residues, regenerative grazing and, health and soil health and carbon sequestration in grazing lands, along with multiple concurrent presentations and a poster session, all part of this educational conference. Now, bring your attention to today, uh, we're breaking the feed and forage section into three sections, highlighting innovative approaches to three different challenges impacting Kansas forage producers that were identified from last year's summit. Uh, we'll start in Western Kansas, and Joe Hilger's flex approach to managing his crop rotation and scarce water resource with the goal of getting the most forage for every inch of water. Now, I believe they're all on this morning, so I'm going to turn things over to Ron Miller with Alpharex Seed, Ted Hesslink with eForage Seed Company, and Joe Hilger in the field at Granada Farms. We'll have an open Q&A session after their presentation, but also please feel free uh, to type any questions in the chat area. Uh, Ron, take it away. Well, I'm Ron Miller with Alfrex Seed and Dairyland, and uh, we're out here today in southwest Kansas, southeast Colorado, talking to Joe Hilger with Grenada Farms, uh, and Ted Hesslink with E-Forage Seeds. We're, we're here today to, to talk to Joe and uh, get some, gather some information about how Joe handles alfalfa in limited water situations. J Joe, can you tell us a little bit about your farm? Um, uh, hi, I'm Joe Hilger. I'm the manager of Grenada Farms. I uh, <clears throat> I have a pretty large uh, farm here in southeast Colorado and in, into Kansas, and we grow mainly alfalfa, corn, wheat, and triticale. Who do you who? What do you do with most of your alfalfa? All of all of my alfalfa goes to uh, Syracuse Dairy. They are. Uh, Granite Farms is part of Syracuse Dairy. Okay. So they're feeding all of it through yeah. there then? Yeah, feeding okay. all of it to them. Okay. Do you do haylage as well as? Uh, yes, um, we do haylage and, and bales. Okay. Just depending on what, what the need, current needs are okay. um, throughout the year. Okay. 
So what do you do uh, when you're looking at your alfalfa acres? Do you, do you have a range of like um, how much water is available on different circles? You know, your high volume water or higher wa volume water to low volume water? Or? Most of my water is, is, is about the same across the board with the way uh, Kansas works or with Kansas and then uh, Colorado is a little bit different, but uh, typically I try to, what I do is if I, uh, if I allot 24 inches to the field, to the, uh, to the field, what I'll try to do is use those inches at the beginning of the year. So say like 24, if you do five cuttings, I try to apply four inches per, per cutting. So then you have 20 inches. So then you would take, I, what I try to do is take the two inches and apply six inches on the first cutting. And then after my last cutting, I'll apply two more inches. Okay. Um, I'm very flexible with that depending on weather. Um, what I try to do, especially early on with those six inches for first cutting, is I try to find a weather pattern that I'm not going to use as much water, lose as much water to evaporation on. So I'll look for a nice, cool, calm, cloudy days. I know that with my sprinklers being nozzled at what they are, it takes me about it takes me about five to six days to apply an inch. So what I'll do is I'll look for the best five or six days in that time frame and apply my inch. And if the crop still needs more, I'll, I'll apply more. Also with rains, what I'll do with a rain, if it comes in and rains a half inch, the crop at early April, uh, any time in there is, is between, uses between a quarter inch and a half inch of water a day. So if you get a half inch rain, you kind of figure, shut off your sprinklers for two, two to three days. If you get an inch rain, that's about a week's worth of water. So what I try to do with my management is use the rainwater and not try to water during that time. If my crops are wet, you shut it off. My theory in that is, is if we, if I allot four to six inches during the early cuttings and I don't have to use those inches then, I can flex that water into the time where it's hot or where we're gonna need more water. And that's how I try to manage my alfalfa. Okay. Do you ever alternate your cutting schedules for as far as like uh, uh, how many days between cuttings based on you know, that? Or? No, um, my cutting schedules is just based off of days and, and, and that's why that that's why the inches work because I've done I've done the math to know how many days it takes to apply those four inches. Okay. So I, I pretty well know it's a set time and what, what the alfalfa grows during that time is what it grows and then we'll cut it and go on. Cause you can, you could spend a lot of inches trying to get more tons, but your quality goes down. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to maintain that. You've got to maintain there. that too. Mm -hmm. Well, Joe, you talked about, you know, keeping up with all these schedules and rainfall and, and how much water you're applying and things like that. How do you keep track of all of that information? So what I do is, is uh, here in Southeast Colorado, I have to report my water every month. So um, I read my water meters every month and I take that, what I've applied that month. And so I, I get an update monthly or per cutting how much water I have. And then I evaluate how much water I have going forward. So you can really see like what you, what, what's going on with your crop. Like, well, I over applied or under applied. So that gives you the idea of going forward of how much water you have. So with that information, I look at like a lot of the long term forecasts and see what the long term forecasts are saying. And then I also look at the short term forecast. Like if I see that there's a there's going to be a wet period for three to four days to a week, I already have the idea that if it rains a half inch on the first day, I'm going to shut off and we're going to see what that weather system does and sometimes you have to start right back up and that and that's it i mean you, you do have more management that you have to do as a manager of watching water and weather and helping your guy and helping your guys make the decisions on when to turn on and shut off and sometimes you shut off and you have to go turn right back on but that's okay you still you just you just it's it's a constant evaluation of weather versus crop versus versus water that you have allocated so it's a 
it's a balancing act of what you got to do and what I've what I've found is I have to just set that time aside I could be out in the field I can be doing a lot of things but you have to take time to manage the water itself if you don't take that time no it doesn't matter what's going on in the field you're not gonna use that water to efficient mm. efficiently I mean what we're trying to do and what all farmers are trying to do is grow more with less right the less less water we spit put on it the less money we spend mm -hmm. and so what we have to do is find ways to shut off to not spend that money okay so you 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 basically keep a pretty tight record of what you've done and how it affected how your crops have grown yes that, yes uh, so so I know how many inches I've applied I typically know how many tons I've grown and so I, what I'm always trying to do is evaluate how much water equals how many tons or and that rolls into fertilizers it rolls into varieties it rolls into everything I mean like I said as farmers we're trying to spend less money to grow more crops and the only way to do that is to find the most efficient ways to to grow that crop and one of those efficiency ways is water because we can spend a lot of money and put a lot of water on hybrids that don't work or or situations that don't work right and then we're spending money and we're not gaining any money but if we can find a way to to not put on as much water not spend the money in gas and electricity and all that we you, will be better off do you uh, sort of the soil type is, is a big factor if, if I'm correct yes soil type is a big factor on my farm here um, I have a lot I have soil types down by the river that are very mucky and, and clayish and then I have a, a, a sand uh, some really sandy soil up in the top too so you have to manage those differently because even even with the rain so the rain affects it differently the absorption rates the evaporation rates would affect it all differently and so it's it's knowing what your field needs that current field needs and trying to take and water at the least amount of possible to get as much profit as you can so, so basically you watch field by field by field it's not a, a blanket it's not a, it's not a blanket application. application I try to I try to watch it field by field by field and it's it's very taxing to do but you still make you still gain money that way and right. tons well Joe you covered a lot of information there how do you keep track of all of that data so what you know there's I, I have a couple different spreadsheets that I've built uh, the, wa the water meters I've, I've built a spreadsheet so that I've built a couple you know so that I know one what the water meters putting out and uh, two I convert that to acre inches uh, throughout a couple spreadsheets so I keep track of that throughout the years just to know how much I put on and then the weather data I mean weather data is easy to find mm -hmm. and uh, so I don't track it near as hard but the, the, the water and the tons I, I track pretty I track pretty heavily it's it, you have one thing you have to do is you have to spend time in front of a computer yeah to to, uh, to make sure that that you know what that is going on and where and where that water is going and how much is producing okay okay where where you're where you're dealing with basically two different allocation programs mm -hmm. Kansas versus Colorado yep you still manage about the same for each and in other words you keep track of the, about the same information yeah the, the 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 base information is the same the amount of water that is different i mean kansas has a has a set allocation whether it be 18 or 24 inches a year whereas colorado in 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 our area runs off of uh runs off of shares and allocations for those shares based on uh uh, based on rainfall and uh, snow, snow, snow snowpack pack coming down coming down the river so in, in Colorado I, I manage a little bit different because um, your you know your outlook might not doesn't come out until after the snowpack is finished so right. it's or later on in the year whereas in Kansas I can plan you can plan a year to year you could have a five-year plan because you know you're still going to get your 18 24 inches where in Colorado you don't so what you have to do with the water management in Colorado is you have to decide what is your better crop what's going to make you more money and then you then you plant other crops so if if uh, if you have alfalfa and you know you want to give that alfalfa alfalfa its full profile, you have to 
take that you have to cut the water somewhere else right. and so you plant different things other places so it's a constant evaluation of what works and what doesn't work what's a good low value or high value low water use crop and we all know that alfalfa we need uses water so you treat alfalfa better and you treat those other crops not as well so it's a constant evaluation I, and it don't matter if you do have a, uh, a set allocation you, you always have to evaluate how much water you have how much water you need to apply and what your crop looks like and, and um, you, you stated earlier about you've got basically a set schedule as to how many inches you put on per cutting yes and and that only varies unless mother nature helps you yeah so but, but on the other side of that if mother nature isn't kind and we go into a, a worse drought than we're already in do you do you think uh, maybe backing off on some of the water in areas during that extreme drought temperature with helps or, or do you not pay attention to that well i think i think you have to have an evaluation on what your long-term goals are for your alfalfa one and how many cuttings you're going to have so what i would do is if we got into a long-term drought and my water became less i would drop a cutting and try to and try to better better grow the other cuttings exactly. is what i would do instead of trying to spread instead of trying to spread 12 inches across five cuttings i would take and try to spread that across three is what i would do or two and a half because that's and and really play your weather there if if, if if you had to you'd only water on cloudy days that it, and, and, and i know it it uh it sounds crazy when it's 100 and some odd degrees but if if uh if, if your water's that short you're gonna have to do crazy things that's, right that's where alfalfa is the ideal crop for that because you can drought an alfalfa mm -hmm. and not really damage it it will come back so alfalfa ideally if if i was to do it you could when you're in those july august time frames when your heat is extremely high alfalfa doesn't grow as fast or as well you would ideally not water during that time and then when your temperatures start cooling down you would you would bring the rest of your water in and try to try to take advantage of that fall time frame so you'd say you would you do first and second cutting may and june and you'd water that really well and then come august september you drop those two cuttings or one and then you would pick back up and go alfalfa will respond to that i've i've, I've seen it happen here where uh something happens on the farm a well goes down a sprinkler gets broke and falls over and you don't water that field for a cutting and you look at it and you're like is this field ever going to come back and it does it might take one extra inch to do it but it will come back and it will still grow good so that that gives you a lot more having alfalfa gives you a lot more flexibility in those situations rather than if you have you had all corn acres or yeah, something so, so you know um alfalfa tillers because it's grows from a crown whereas corn doesn't corn you corn you have one shot and one chance so you got to keep it watered very well and for a long period for a longer period of time because corn doesn't tiller yeah. and, it, and 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 the way corn works is it sets its it sets its production early on so you have to keep that early on and throughout mm -hmm. whereas alfalfa will can and will go dormant on you and does not grow but as soon as it gets water it flexes back mm -hmm. it's the same for milo milo will will shut down gets rain it put it tillers more but that's where corn doesn't do is it doesn't tiller and yeah. so that's why alfalfa is a good is a good crop to flex water a whole lot more do you utilize uh sorghums and things like that in your other acres when you talked about having having the, those those uh uh years that are up and down and that flexibility with the snowpack coming down and your water fluctuating amounts um, do you use the sorghums more than the corns on those acres yeah so so working for syracuse dairy i have to grow i'm going to grow with a certain amount of corn mm -hmm. and so what i have to do is take that water and, and that water that's allocated for it goes to the corn and then after that we we flex plant different acres to different crops uh, forage sorghum being one of them forage sorghums and millets mm -hmm. and uh, milos are, are very good at flex watering or what i call flex watering and so um when it rains that crop will tiller more 
and, and produce more. And so it's all cost management and water management. Take the, take your high value crops and water those the best, and then your your lower value crops, your your lease water. You can flex with lower value crops, and if it rains, they can make pretty well. Mm -hmm. So what is the range like with this snowpack um, and you're, when you're dealing with that water, is there a range for, that you've seen over your career of highs and what's the high and the low of allocations? Well, it, it's all based on shares, so oh, okay. you, you can flex a little bit, but I've seen where it runs off a of percentage. I've seen 30% and I've seen 100%. So yeah. we, get, we, we, get the, we get the forecast and the outlook early on and, and I try to flex water through that mm -hmm. and manage it the best. And, and if it flexes and changes, you change with it. You got to be flexible. And even even in on my Kansas farm, I I'm flexible. You know, um, the, the, truthfully, honest, the name of the game is be flexible and be proactive. If you're not proactive and you do the set thing every year, you know what the definition of crazy is, right? <laughs> Doing the same thing over and over and get and expecting different results. Yeah. So, just through my farm and what I my thinking is is I'm always looking to grow more with less. Yeah. Well, you, you know, from being in the seed business, we're always pushed to get, make those decisions and know how much we're going to order and know how much, what particular variety or product we're going to sell at a certain time, you know, years in advance. You keep saying that you get that allocation early on. What time frame are you looking at? Because I, I, I would suspect I say, that those I say decisions... early on, I typically maybe... February, you might have a little bit of an outlook, but it's not really done till April. Yeah. So, so, so I have what I do is I run like two or three contingency plans. In all honesty, so I do what a hundred percent allocation would be. I have a plan for that, and then if I hear that there might be a little less water, I come up with a different plan. And so it's all about, and it, it's the same way if I when I farm in Kansas, if you have a, a lower allocation or an allocation you don't know if you're planning on planting corn and it doesn't rain and you know you need that rainwater you need, you flex to something else mm -hmm. but if it rains a lot then you flex the corn it's the same principle yeah. it's yeah. just it's the ebb and flow of, of a farm and the weather where you are looking to do more with less yeah you you mentioned something earlier when we were talking that about mother nature and having 80 percent of can you say that again that you know, I, I i couldn't quote you the study but it, it, it said that mother nature is, is affects 80 percent of the, your crop and you only affect 20 percent of yeah. it so you got to really manage that other 20 percent yeah you got to really manage close. you got to manage your 20 percent the most you can and then you got to take advantage of what mother nature gives you yeah well, Joe, I'd, I'd really like to thank you for having us out today and Grenada Farms for, for hosting us out here today just to kind of talk some of this about how you manage limited irrigation. I think it'll be a lot of interest to a lot of people. So no problem. Thank, thank you, you very guys. much. All right, Joe, Ron, Ted. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I tell you, I think we can jump now. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, again, you should be able to unmute yourselves and ask or uh, tap it into the chat. And I believe Robin will share those. I do see that there is one question, or I've got a couple here actually. Um, are you, and this would be a question for Joe. Are you using any low lignin varieties? And if so, how might they impact how you manage irrigation relative to normal varieties? So can you hear me? Yes. So I do have some low lignin alfalfa, but with the size of my farm, I just have to continue to cut on schedule. Um, ideally, I think with the low lignin alfalfa, if you planted your whole farm to it and you could flex your whole farm at the same time, that's probably where they're the best. Let's see, I think there might be another question here. Um, can you speak to the differences between the Colorado and Kansas um, regarding excess water rights being offered to farmers? Say, say that again. 
Can you speak to the differences between Colorado and Kansas regarding excess water rights being offered to farmers? So Kansas is is a is set water rights, whereas in uh, my area in Colorado, it's based on shares. So as long as you can buy shares, you can continue to apply water versus Kansas where the water rights are pretty well set. Joe, I might pipe one in. Um, you know, I tell you, every year you always have, you know, something happens, quality goes bad. Was you guys pretty much connected fairly close to the dairy? I mean, what happens when you get some just, you know, how do, how do you handle poor quality alfalfa? Or, or is it one of the things you're getting it picked up so quick that, you no, know, you're always able to maintain, you know, good enough? And how, how are, are you making adjustments? So how does the dairy then make adjustments if quality changes throughout a year? So that, that, that's just based on like, uh, you still have to feed heifers, replacement heifers and, and things like that. So whatever, whatever we get is just, it's gonna get fed. Um, not meaning that we don't try to put up good quality alfalfa, but if you're putting up more than 30 or 40% of your alfalfa, like perfect, you're, you're, you're doing really well because mother nature has more to do with hay quality than what we like to think. Hey folks, don't be shy. If you have any questions, please pipe up and ask. I don't currently see any more in the in the chat, so um, please feel free to do so, or we can move on to the the next part. All right. Hey, Joe. Again, thank you so much, and and Ron and Ted, thank you for helping pull this thing together. Uh, man, I I'd, I'd love to get out there and and uh, see Granada Farms. You guys did a great job, and thanks so much. Uh, our next section is uh, focused on woody encroachment in Kansas and rangelands. Uh, and I think, you know, you don't have to drive very far uh, down pretty much any highway in Kansas and you, you know what we mean. Uh, we continue to see a lot of it. Uh, in this session uh, or in this section, they're going to outline uh, what I consider a novel approach to managing these invasive woody species. Uh, one of the things they emphasize is that it's not about cleaning up one pasture or ranch, but changing the entire landscape, really, uh, making this then a, a community based approach. So as you watch this section, regardless of how you're connected to agriculture in Kansas, whether you're a landowner, a farmer, ranch manager, educator, or something else, I'd ask that you think about what your role is and, and what you can do to defend our core grasslands and then help grow that core. Uh, leading this session is, is Doug Spencer, our state grazing specialist uh, with NRCS. Doug? Well, hello and uh, welcome today to the Jetsam Hills of Kansas. And so I'm Doug Spencer. I'm the state grazing specialist here in Kansas. Uh, I'm with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. And today, uh, Russell Blue has had us out and we're gonna have kind of a unique conversation about sort of a roundup. And a lot of times we think of a roundup being with like livestock or cattle, um, but this one's actually gonna be more about woody plants or woody encroachment. And so Russell, appreciate you having us out here to tell you, just kind of tell us about you and, and kind of your operation here. Sure. Uh, my name is Russell Blue. We're here in the Jip Hills of Barber County, the southwest part of Barber County on the Nichols Ranch. Uh, we've operated the, the ranch here for uh, close to 10 years. And I say we, I'm referring to my brother and myself. Um, took the ranch on in 2012, the spring of 2012, kind of amid a drought. And so um, the ranch has been a project. It was, it was uh, uh, in poor shape as far as, as the grass is concerned and also we had a, a cedar tree problem, a serious cedar tree problem. So uh, consequently due to the cedar trees and obviously amid the, the drought we had a, a, a water problem as well. So um, took the ranch on knowing that the cedars were at the very forefront, the woody species was at the forefront of, of what we needed to do to get the ranch snapped back into shape. And so that's been uh, kind of our, our uh, our big push here the last several years is just uh, trying to get as many cedar trees as many woody invasives down as we can and get them dead and and uh, restoring the range and as far as kind of you and uh, an approach is kind of how long have you kind of been about it did you said kind of 2012 or so is where it really kind of put the 
put the throttle down and really started uh, approaching that brush issue? Sure, yeah, 2012 is when we took the ranch on and we jumped right into to, uh, um, tackling the, the, uh, the issue at hand. And so um, this is actually, uh, where we're standing on the ranch today has almost come full circle. So um, it's been about a nine year process, but we are, uh, we're working towards where we wanna be. We're, we're uh, I'd say, you know, to quantify it, we're at about 96, 98 percent where we want to be, and so uh, to drive that final nail in the coffin, so to speak, as far as where we want to be in terms of woody invasives, we're almost there. So um, I didn't necessarily have the goal uh, to be where we wanted to be within 10 years when we took the ranch on, but uh, that's that's where we're going to end up. It's going to take us right at 10 years to to uh, accomplish our goals. Okay, okay. I think a lot of the viewers probably can relate to this. Is the challenge of brush encroachment. I know a lot of ranchers and managers, they really try to, you know, spend the time out there and they've invested a lot of effort in that. And and I think it's a little bit challenging. I, I kind of back to this idea of sort of this roundup or things like that. Is that. There's so many times, you know, everybody dreads that phone call from the neighbor. Hey, your cows are out. You know, and it sort of puts this, um, you know, we're definitely sort of drop things and really start going after it, or we start really noticing that. And in this particular instance, it's kind of interesting because our neighbor to the north, Drack Twidwell, is, a, is a, with the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and has really um, looked at things and woody encroachment from a regional perspective. And so we really want to take the, the, the time and really appreciate sort of Drack letting us know, hey, something's going on with woody encroachment. Uh, Drack, would you, would you first, he's, he's joining us remotely today. And so Drack, if you first would just kind of say, you know, something about you as well as your role. Hey, I'm Drack Twidwell. I'm a associate professor and rangeland ecologist at the University of Nebraska. I'm also serving in a capacity as a science advisor role for the USDA NRCS for the Great Plains region. And really, we were asked to uh, help provide a better science-based strategy to deal with the problem of woody encroachment in Great Plains grasslands um, and, and help NRCS partners and landowners to uh, get ahead of this issue. It's something that uh, that's definitely been one of those impossible challenges in rangelands almost uh, for the Great Plains. There's very few large scale success stories. And we were able to really start working with, with these larger landowner groups, uh, you know, different prescribed burn associations uh, like the Les Canyons of Nebraska, uh, groups that, that often function larger and across neighboring properties like the Sand Hills Task Force, uh, landowners in the Flint Hills of Kansas, um, and including landowners, you know, like the area of the Gypsum Hills in South Central Kansas, these larger landowner groups were, were trying to create creative ideas and ways of solving the woody encroachment problem. And by working hand in hand with them at large scales, we were starting to be able to, to really develop scientific solutions that not only benefited those regions, but benefit our, our whole knowledge set on how to better address the issue. And so, yeah, I'd really appreciate that, uh, Drac, and really appreciate you sort of giving us that call, or at least and I know you're approaching things from a regional perspective, but what is the information that you really looked at or saw, and would you share that with us today of kind of this, this idea of woody encroachment and at the scale and, and the speed at which it's occurring, would you get into some of the details with that and let us know what you're observing from, from, from being that neighbor role? Now, what we saw and, you know, across the Great Plains as a whole. And the Great Plains, you can see in this map, you know, expands really from the Rocky Mountains here to the west, all the way to this eastern border, uh, and the sea of grass that defines the biome of the Great Plains. And everywhere that you see more in blue here today is grassland dominated ecosystems. And, you know, these places that are red, like, you know, the Black Hills of South Dakota, uh, this area of red in the middle of the Sand Hills is Halsey National Forest, you know, which is hand planted cedar forest there. Those are our tree dominated systems. So you can see this boundary that exists today uh, of where grassland ecosystems are winning versus where uh, a woody dominated biome is winning. And we're able to showcase where that biome exists and realize biomes have been conserved since really the last ice age. Uh, 
And so if we see movement at biome scales, that fundamentally changes how these systems work. And that's what we've been able to track and, and see. And that's why we're working with landowners across these regions. Over a 20-year period, you're talking about significant and substantial losses of our grassland biome to now what's this more woody pressure and woody dominated system. And when that biome hits you, it increases the management costs to rangeland producers, and it makes it much more difficult for us to sustain these, these last iconic grassland ecosystems. Now we spend a ton of money um, in grasslands on brush management and woody encroachment, but we tend to spend that money in the red, the areas that are that become a huge problem after, uh, you know, after this initial resource concern, we tend to, to wait until it's this bigger investment and that costs a lot of money. And so we spent $177 million in the last farm bill, for example, on brush management. Most of those funds go into the red. And it starts to beg the question, what if we got out in front of it? Because that, that experiment has played out. And so that's when we started really coming down to Kansas and, you know, at the request of producer groups to say, hey, can we come up with better solutions to deal with this issue, given what hasn't worked in the past? One of the challenges is just how we viewed this problem. Uh, usually we wait until there's this, uh, you know, large amount of woody encroachment on the landscape, like this picture here you're seeing on the left side of the graph. And when we were flying over, we were, we were documenting often these areas to the right that we tend to not focus on and manage. We, we don't think that there's a problem there yet. And we say, oh, those are intact rangeland acres. Well, in reality, they're not. The, uh, what they are is their future encroachment acres. These areas are contaminated by seed from those mature trees that are just on that neighboring property or in that neighboring pasture. And if we wait, what happens? Those seeds reproduce, they germinate, uh, and it forms future trees that we have to manage. So we're always chasing the problem. And it's basically like being kind of ambulance drivers. We're constantly, you know, chasing the problem into our best intact and most productive rangelands. That's an unwinnable strategy for managing this problem. If we're going to correctly manage this issue, we have to get ahead of this spatial pattern of encroachment and start to anchor conservation areas to intact grassland core areas. And that's one of the things that we missed with, with kind of our science-based guidance in the past. They reproduce by seed, and most of that seed recruits within a very close proximity to seed sources. We, instead of chasing future trees, let's start getting ahead of the problem. That's where this philosophy is coming in, and we see groups that are using this philosophy tend to win. So instead of being ambulance drivers, get ahead of it, defend the core, grow the core, keep our best and most productive rangelands intact. So let's go to an example in Kansas. Uh, here's an area of South Central Kansas in the Gypsum Hills, one of these big iconic grassland regions that are remaining. And let's walk through an example that we did with them there in terms of being able to get ahead of the issue and what that means for that area. So here we're starting in 2000, uh, and we were kind enough be, to be given information by producers of where they were trying to build core areas and protect them. And let's just watch why that becomes such an important issue long term now. Uh, over time, everywhere red looks more like these cedar dominated uh, areas. Everywhere green is more these grassland dominated areas. And watch this expansion in the Gypsum Hills. You know, again, the, the plight to producers and the cost to their rangeland production, you really see how quickly this is taking off in areas like this. And by 2015, you have this huge multi county problem at your hands that's so expensive to manage. And as we play this forward, all of a sudden you see what emerges is this big kind of uh, chunk taken out of those cedar dominated zones. And that was Anderson Creek wildfire here. Uh, took a huge amount of area, killed a lot of cedar trees. And what this producer group started to do is double down following that wildfire and make sure that it didn't come back, that any of the cedar trees that it missed they were going to start to take those seed sources out, really start to uh, manage seed that might be residually left over in the seed bank uh, by restoring prescribed fire at large scales. And really look how you see that signal kind of hardening, right? There's these core areas in these green zones that are strongly intact grasslands and they're continuing to try and firm up. The benefits to this to the producer are huge. Instead of waiting 
And so you have this huge economic impact to your livelihood, up to 75% of your livelihood on rangeland. Get ahead of that. We don't want them to lose that economic uh, value of their land. We want to prevent that from happening. So, so in those areas, we were actually able to study that and measure it and quantify it um, and see the benefits of building cores rather than chasing the problem. All right. Well, we sure appreciate Dirac sharing with us all that information and from a region perspective. And we still need to kind of think back and we will bring it, you know, to, to Russell's, you know, local. How do we how do we approach things at a local level? How do we do those things? We brought in uh, Dusty Taha, who uh, works within RCS as well. And so, Dusty, just uh, introduce yourself and kind of your role. Yeah. So my name is Dusty Taha. I work for USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service. I'm a area range specialist. I work out of the Hutchinson area office, uh, covering uh, south central, southwestern Kansas. So um, all the Jip Hills here that we're standing in and and westward and. Uh, I have the opportunity to come out and, and work with uh, ranchers and other um, livestock producers like Russell on, on their grassland issues, including the uh, the woody encroachment, the, the woody invasive uh, issue at hand here that we're talking about today. Appreciate that. I know as Drock was talking, you know, it comes to my mind and kind of back this idea of this roundup or something that that neighbor gives that call. And the first thing that goes through my mind before we even go out to sort of gather is was our weak spot in the fence, who left the gate open, those types of things. And so I, I guess as I think of the woody encroachment, have we sort of taken a look back, are there things that we've noticed that might be some weak spots in our past approaches and or left the gate open? And so just maybe sharing those ideas or what what you've observed and seen. Yeah, so we, you know, we've been at the, uh the brush encroachment uh, issue for, for a long time. I mean, this is this is nothing new um, from an agency's perspective, and it's certainly nothing new um, from a from a rancher manager in the landscape perspective. Um, but but we've certainly um, left some weak spots in our approaches, and and um, a couple come to mind where uh, previously when, when we would a attack an issue like this, or you know if we were to attack the situation over our shoulder here on the neighboring property, um, we were we were getting the denser areas of trees that were that were obvious problems and we were also um, getting the, the low hanging fruit and and what we were leaving on the landscape um, was the was the really scattered low density trees and we were we that, that would eventually go on to, to produce seed and disperse seed back over um, where we'd just cut the denser areas and we were also in, in, in this part of the world um, where you can see we have a lot of topography and harder to access country we were leaving the areas that we simply couldn't access um, by machine they, they were they were going to be difficult to cut either really really difficult to access with a machine or just flat out not accessible in other words um, meaning that they would have to be done by hand with chainsaw and then that sort of method and and those two would would produce seed and 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 would then put everything that we had put efforts and money towards clearing back at risk of, of reinfestation. And uh, so those were two issues that come to the top of the mind on the brush clearing end of things. And then one, one final and very important point is that um, we, were, we were cutting trees um, and then frequently not having people, um, even though we'd commonly recommend it, um, it wasn't always happening. We, uh, there was no prescribed fire being used as a follow-up tool, um, you know, after the cutting, and so um, cutting trees doesn't remove seed from the soil. What removes seed from the soil, is particularly in the case of, of eastern red cedar, is fire. And should those seeds go ahead and, and sprout, and then we have recruitment level trees, what also removes those from the landscape is fire. And so without without fire in the system, it, it, it was just this nasty negative cycle where we never we never put the as Russell put it, the final nail in the coffin. Um, we, we just didn't finish the job. All right, so we kind of left off with, uh, <clears throat> you know, a discussion about sort of maybe some of the things we missed. I know, Dusty, you mentioned about sort of that seed source, sort of that what that kind of means and for the producer. And so I think I'd like to maybe just take a few minutes to sort of highlight what that, you know, what how do we miss and what does that look like on a landscape? And we kind of have maybe a pretty good example right here you're standing in. Yeah, so... You know, we, we've we've come to find out that that um, what the dispersal distance is of, of particularly eastern red cedar, and and we, we find that that the, the the brunt of the seed, the quantity of seed uh, that's going to be dispersed from a seed producing tree gets dis dispersed within about 200 yards of that mother tree, and so if if you if you calculate that up. 
if you have one lone seed producing tree standing out there and you draw a 200 yard radius circle around that tree, that equates to just shy of 26 acres. That one seed producing tree puts at risk. So if you leave one of them out there, it's 26 acres. So if you have a bunch of them scattered, that adds up pretty quick. And so what, what may appear to be fairly tree free landscape, but just with a few scattered ones, is actually a seriously at risk landscape for reinfestation. And that's kind of what we're, what we're looking at here. So we can see the, the larger trees in the background here, and it really wouldn't matter whether that's on a neighboring property or, or a, a patch of trees internal to a property left. You know, we, we have large seed producing trees, and that's, that's about 200 yards behind us here. And we have both male and female trees, so you know, females have the, have the seed on them, males obviously not. Um, and then we have seed dispersal, and these right here, which are no longer a threat to us, or not, aren't going to be a threat because the prescribed burn that, that was conducted here just, just a couple months ago uh, killed these, but these would have been trees that could have dispersed, you know, seed coming from, from those seed producers down here. So, um, you know, we, we, I guess the, the, the point is we, we've got to take care of all the seed producing trees at a, at a bare minimum. Um, otherwise, we're going to constantly be fighting uh, recruitment of trees like this, which just uh, increases the, the, the management workload tremendously. So I know Russell, you said you're, you're just about there and you're really going to kind of get over that hump on that. And so I guess as we look across the landscape then is, is your approach to that. Again, kind of thinking back to this idea of sort of this roundup, you know, is, is kind of maybe relate that sort of cattle gathering, things like that, and sort of how we missed in the past and sort of your new vision for, hey, we see this as the final success here, how we're going to go about doing that. Certainly. So, um, you know, again, it's in, in retrospect, you know, nine years ago when we started this, this video, venture as far as where we want to take this ranch you know being tree fee, tree free or seed free you know that didn't necessarily occur to me we knew that we had a problem we wanted less trees than what we had currently and so um, you know we've we've actually found ourselves to be in a position where we're really close I mean we're within you know three to five percent of just of uh, putting the final nail in the coffin on where we would like to be tree free and seed free in regard to brush management and so um, you know we, we, we cannot afford to to uh, take our foot off the throttle so to speak and so it wasn't until some of the information that Direct Woodwell had brought to our attention via uh, the RAPS data you know as to how fast woody encroachment was moving and so, um, you know, with that being said, the, the idea of, of getting within that tolerable uh, margin or being within that five to 10% uh, margin was just not an option for us. We knew that we, we wanted to uh, eliminate that last three to 5%. And so, you know, the analogy has been made, uh, you know, when you gather cattle, you don't go out and, and uh, hope that you gather 95% of them and, and you get 95% and that's within, well, that's close enough. Uh, that's within our margin. We'll leave the rest of them. No, you take all of them. I mean, if you, if you miss them, you go back. So, uh, that's that's definitely our approach in regard to uh, maintaining woody species here. We we want to knock it out of the park, put the nail in the coffin, and so we can move on to the to the next challenge. And so, uh, you know, I think of it as as uh, you can manage this this woody invasive problem continually for the rest of your life, or we can get it to a maintenance level where we can control it with prescribed fire and and uh, minimal uh, mechanical efforts right now and and from here on for generations to come it could be a maintenance level if they if they manage it properly yeah from your standpoint then as you, as you think of a vision moving forward with, with the ranch is, is again just what does that mean for you conservation of rangelands and, and you specifically on your ranch sure so so uh, you know it can be put to a, a dollars and cents a cost per acre standpoint or or a time investment standpoint so you know the old approach to to managing within those margins or the, those those tolerable margins um, you know if we were to cut cut these areas and just knock the trees back to a 10 percent infestation or a five percent infestation you can count on being back there in 10 years and spending another 200 250 dollars an acre that's that's a given um, 
without a doubt you're going to be doing it another 10 years if you if you don't eliminate the seed source that's out there you'll be back there maintaining it another 10 years so from a cost standpoint obviously it makes sense for us to to nip it in the bud so to speak and uh, and take care of it now and and knock it back to a maintenance level um, also from a, a management standpoint um, you know just just the time invested to uh, manage between those margins the time invested that that it would take to keep it between that margins as opposed to knocking it out and keeping it at a maintenance level the time invested is just uh, it, it's obviously attractive to us to just knock it out so um, again th this is data that wasn't necessarily readily available to us it was it was brought to my attention by by Dirac um, but you know in years past we wouldn't yeah we we'd execute a prescribed fire and and there might be a tree on the side slope there someplace and and uh, we'd drive by it for another three or five years bef until it had another dozen trees or so around it and so we we didn't really recognize that seed source and the speed at which encroachment was occurring until that wraps data was was brought to light all right well really want to thank the, the viewers uh, today and we were thankful to Russell for letting us come out on the ranch and, and view just a beautiful landscape I think that's the one thing is I really wish we could bottle this up and send it to you there's just an awe and ex kind of an awe experience as we stand out here and really appreciate this rangeland thank you Dusty for a lot of the technical information and remotely thank you Dirac and just really kind of giving us that neighbor phone call and, and really helping us realize sort of what wood encroachment is doing to our rangelands and, and just really wanted to you know I think most of the viewers really want to hear sort of a parting shot from from the the person that's that's making it happen and creating a landscape like this and that doesn't come cheap or easy um, but just Russell would like to just come maybe some closing thoughts and what you'd like to share with with our viewers and, and those ranchers kind of maybe either facing this or maybe a, a step to take sure so um, you know I think as, as ranchers and land managers you know we're we're certainly independent and and we can really get focused on what we're doing on our day-to-day -day tasks and and what we'd like to accomplish but um, you know the focus today is definitely woody encroachment and it's not a it's not a ranch wide issue it's uh, it's not even a a, uh, a, a rancher uh, focused issue it's a community issue and so we've got to start managing beyond our fence lines beyond our ranch borders and so you know that coordination between uh, neighboring ranches and and uh, neighboring uh, operators is paramount and so um, as I said we're we are an independent species by trait and so um, you know the quicker we can start collaborating and working together in terms of uh, executing some prescribed fires and, and recognizing the major threat here which is moving at, at a lot faster pace than what we had originally uh, perceived uh, the better off we're going to be but I can't stress enough that the idea of managing beyond our ranch borders, beyond our fence lines, is paramount. So, um, you know, getting with neighbors and working together to recognize a common threat, uh, I think that's, that's key. Wow. Defend the core, grow the core. It's not just about keeping it uh, tree free, but seed free. Uh, these are incredible concepts. Great job, Doug, Russell, Dusty, Dirac. Uh, I, I tell you, that was awesome. Uh, before we open up to questions though, uh, uh, do any of you in this video section, uh, Doug, Russell, Dusty, Dirac, do you have any comments, anything, you, anything you'd like to add uh, before we turn it over to questions? Hey, Mark. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, one of the things, I guess, just to let all, everyone know is we some of our core grassland areas, we do have a program where we're trying to help step alongside with ranchers using their, there's definitely a will out there to do something like Russell, you know, those ranchers. And so we've got a, a Great Plains Grassland Initiative. So if you're interested in that, we can kind of, there's some information on our website, things like that. But I think the other thing, Mark, it's interesting is we've got a lot of data about, you know, bushels of wheat and corn and tons of forage. What's really awesome about this new data is we're getting information and I'll have maybe Drac step in here and help kind of inform, but we start knowing how much forage as a state we produce and it's a lot. It's pretty exciting. And so there's a there's a large amount of forage that we're defending by going after this tree invasion. So Drac, if you want to share any thoughts on that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, it's just a 
it's just amazing the kind of technology and information that we finally have coming from rangelands. Um, you know, part of what's new on the rangeland analysis platform, and, and this is an analysis led by Scott Morford at, uh, that is part of our kind of science team. What, what we, you know, we often talk about how much is produced in the Great Plains. So, you know, Nebraska, Kansas, these huge biomass producing agricultural states. I mean, uh, and I never know what a bushel of corn actually feels like or looks like, uh, but, you know, when we converted that, like Kansas, a couple of years ago, we're talking 44 billion pounds of corn. I mean, it's just, and we were looking for numbers because we start, we finally can quantify that for rangeland. So in rangelands that same year, Kansas rangeland produced, you know, 59.9 billion pounds of, uh, of forage. Like we grow a ton of biomass in our Great Plains ecosystems, but we never communicated it that way in rangeland. We did, you know, what was in a small little plot at our feet. We never communicated the ag game like the rest of agriculture. So yeah, we've grown a ton of, of biomass, but we've also lost a ton to woody encroachment. So we also know that Kansas has lost 3 million, uh, sorry, three, not 3 million. We've lost 3 billion pounds of, uh, of biomass to woody encroachment. I mean, you take a place like the Flint Hills, uh, we lost almost a billion pounds due to woody encroachment since 2019. And that's, that's our last and greatest tall grass prairie ecosystem. So, so the threat is real. It's just, it slowly eats away every year over the last few decades, kind of like aging. You just wake up 30 years later and you look different. Uh, kind of like this wisdom I've got in my hair now. That's, that's our range land. That's why it's so tough to manage. It's just slowly taking land out of ag production. We now have the numbers to show it. And uh, we have a new guide coming out as part of multi-state extension that provides better solutions on how to deal with it. So look for that as well. Russell, I, I see you're unmuted. Do you have any comments for the group? No, no. I, uh, I'm just taking it all in. All right, that's all right. Hey, uh, Robin, do we have any questions in the chat you want to go through? We actually do. I've got three or four here real quick. Um, the first question is probably for Dirac. What created such a rapid increase in the woody invasive species in, in 20 years? Is this a typical rate or was there something else going on? Yeah, great question. I mean, as a, as a, a professor, right, I have the benefit of just really tracking the history. And I've worked on this issue from Texas, Oklahoma, all the way up now to the Dakotas. Um, so we just see the same comments in later decades from every state. So, uh, so in the 1990s, Dr. Dave Engel at Oklahoma State was saying that this was the uh, biggest threat to rangelands in the Great Plains because they're seeing this rapid expansion across Oklahoma. And you know, then we say the same thing in Kansas, 15 years later, same thing in Nebraska now, and now the conversation starting in South Dakota. So what happened, right, is, is especially for non-re-sprouting woody plants like Eastern Red Cedar, they're highly fire sensitive. So they don't re-sprout after you know, we cut them or if they're burned. So we removed a control that was lit by people for thousands of years in the Great Plains. We, you know, if people don't know, like tall grass prairie on average, a third of that burned a year. That means continentally, we had from Canada in to, to Northern Mexico, we had a third of that tall grass prairie region burning every year. That's huge amounts of fire that controls those kind of woody plants. The second thing that we did is we universally distributed and planted woody plants throughout the entire area. So, so what we've done is we removed the control and we increased exposure. So we, low, we increased our sensitivity by removing treatments and we increased exposure. What we did is massively increased our risk. And that slowly played out until you have exposure to seed sources everywhere now. It's, you almost have no horizons. So th that double whammy really hurt us in rangelands. We have to get back to managing our risk smartly and managing it at large scales. Uh, that's kind of the key to winning it at, at, on big rangelands. 
There's, of course, other things that have played out and happened that are increasing this rates as well. But if I was to pick the top two by far, those are the two that I'm going to pick on. Great, thank you. The next question that has come in is, what other woody plants are a problem in the area? Dusty Russell, you want to speak to that kind of from that like Jip Hills? I know as we move east, and now everyone knows, as we have a lot more re sprouters. And so that's definitely ups, uh, you know, the, the challenge uh, because it's just not fire alone once they get to certain sizes. And so that's one thing, but there's definitely re sprouters, but maybe specifically the Jip Hills area. What are you guys noticing from that standpoint, too? Uh, yeah, Doug, thank you. Um, in the Jip Hills, and, and Dusty could, Dusty or Doug, you two could speak more intelligently on a statewide basis, but we're fortunate in the fact that uh, the majority of our woody invasives we can kill with prescribed fire. Uh, we do have some re-sprouters here along our creek corridors and things of that nature, but um, as I said, not to be redundant, but with ready, with, with uh, prescribed fire, we can, we can uh, really knock back and, and uh, put these cedar trees in check. Um, we are doing some summer burning and things of that nature to, to um, address some of those re sprouters. But as you move further east, and, and as I said, Dusty and Doug, you guys can speak more intelligently about that. But as you move further east, they definitely struggle and battle those re sprouters more than we do. So thank you. Yeah, I. I agree with Russell. I mean, we're fortunate, fortunate in the Jip Hills that the primary issue is, is, is the non, non respreading Eastern red cedar, which is, you know, we, we knocked down the big problem with mechanical treatment, um, follow a prescribed fire and can pretty well maintain with prescribed fire because it's, it does not resprout. Um, you know, we, we do have the, the, the drainage and riparian areas that, that do have, I mean, they have plenty of Eastern red cedar as well as, um, resprouting species that, um, well, like the eastern red cedar, are not not particularly. It's not that they're non-native. It's just that they have um, extended their 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 growth in, into areas that were once tree-free. Um, so in Barber County, where Russell is, I mean, we have a tree we call it China Berry. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a pretty aggressive riparian uh, growth, um, resprouting deciduous tree. Um, we, we've, we have, um, well, I, I think across, across a large swath of the, of the central part of our state and extending eastward, we have a Siberian elm tree. Um, if, you, if you ever get a batch of those going there, they can be a real mess. Um, they, they produce a lot of seed, seeds windblown and spreads readily and, and, and they apparently have a pretty high germ rate um, and you get a, just really thick sprouts. So, those are a problem. Um, they're, they're a problem in areas of Barber County, and particularly as you as you move um, north and, and slightly eastward from there, they're they're certainly a problem. Um, American elms, we we have issues there. I mean, that's not to say that we should go cut every American elm tree, um, but th they're certainly growing in drainages where where they once were not growing. So um, there again, that, that stuff's just slowly working its way up those drainage systems. Where, where they were probably once um, pretty well confined to, to major drains um, and wooded areas, they're, they're now extending upward. The same can be said um, in the Jip Hills for, uh, so American Elms, hackberries, you know, Western hackberry, um, cottonwood, peach leaf willow, you know, all, the, all that stuff is extending up drainages. Uh, we, we frequently find cottonwoods and willows um, that kind of get a foothold far up drainage systems where they where they once were not, uh, frequently due to a change of hydrology due to us. Um, you know, we build embankment structures, you know, ponds, and then that 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 gives you a, a kind of a, a, a harbor growth area for for those uh, water loving trees that wouldn't have normally existed on that that height of the landscape, uh, you know, far up the drainage system and and then seed just spreads up from there. So you know, it's, it's just, a, you know, kind of the, um, a weed is a flower out of place um, thought that, yeah, those trees are native and then you think, oh, well, cottonwood, you know, those belong in Kansas. Well, 
you know, I, I think that's that's true. Um, but there, we, we certainly have them in areas on the landscape where historically they were not. And that in and of itself may not be a problem, but what tends to happen is that, is that increases the management level because those are those, those kind of become the, uh, the, the, the initiation locations and, and the harbor areas of, of trees that will encroach uplands such as Eastern Red Cedar. And I think everybody probably has a, can get a visual of that of a, of a hundred, you know, 80 or hundred year old cottonwood standing and uh, cedars as thick as dog hair growing underneath that cottonwood because that's where the birds have perched and deposited seeds. So yeah, we, we do battle other trees other than cedars and, and that would be probably the, the, the height of the species down there. Obviously, as, as we move further um, north out of the Jip Hills and, and east out of the Jip Hills, I mean, we have other nasty respraying species, uh, honey locust, black locust, uh, Osage orange or hedge. Um, th those were probably kind of kind of top of the list of, of big type offenders. But as far as the Jip Hills, that's, that's pretty much what we deal with. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I do have one more quick question. I think this one is probably for Russell. Um, how do you protect the diversity of the plant community on your ranch? Well, with proper management, proper grazing, and, and again, with prescribed fire. And so um, since you bring that up, you know, uh, wood invasives are, are only, a, you know, that's one fraction of what we battle. We, we also have an introduced species uh, that we battle that's uh, old world blue stem that's made its way into uh, some of these reseeded areas that had been tilled and uh, grown crop acre had grown crops for for a number of years and went back to grass so um, that that's a good point we we do uh, we do have to struggle with uh, with some some things other than just woody invasives but uh, the way we manage um, manage that if we have some some invasive species we we uh well we treat some with herbicide and we uh we manage around it as far as our grazing schedule so uh particularly with old world blue stem we'll we'll uh we'll knock it back as hard as we can uh, and, and graze it hard uh um early in the season and try and come back to it as many times as possible and keep it in a vegetative state where the cattle will actually utilize it uh, there are some people that are have a pretty regimented program with herbicide and they're treating that that species with herbicide and trying to knock it back um, we're, we're trying to to just manage around it with our grazing uh, system and uh, and again with prescribed fire so um, you know proper management and and uh, and fire um, you know the, the the hard work is done by mother nature uh, the, the grass was here long before we were and so if we just mimic what uh what was done years ago you know i think we'll be in we'll be in good shape but um fire is a big part of it and uh and uh again just allowing the rest that it needs to to propagate i mean there was a lot of this ranch that was that was primarily buffalo grass uh close to 10 years ago and um you know just with devising a grazing system um uh, and Thankful NRCS, people like Dusty and Doug to help us put together a, an integral grazing plan. Um, we've we've managed to bring it, bring our native species back. And so we've got a lot of big blue, little blue Indian grass, uh, grasses that we didn't have 10 years ago on this ranch. So uh, just proper management, I guess, to be a to be very generic about it. Um. Russell, thank you so much. Uh, I tell you what, this has been great. I could listen to you folks uh, talking and answering questions all day long, uh, but I've been informed we need to keep moving on. We're probably already gonna run a little bit long uh, for our session. So again, uh, thanks to uh, Doug, Russell, Dusty, and Rock. Uh, this, was, this was a great uh, section for us in this Feed and Forge session. Uh, our, our third and last section is from Eastern Kansas, and it focuses on approaches uh, that, that, that I characterize as trying to expand that number of grazing days that we get uh, by first examining the conversion of crop ground to a grazing system, and second, uh, the incorporation of cover crops uh, and, and grazing cover crops. And uh, I wanna give a quick thanks to Dr. Jamie Lynn Farney, uh, Extension Beef Sp Systems Specialist at the KSU Southeast Research Extension Center, 
for ramrodding both uh, your next two videos uh, and our discussion. So I'll turn this over to Jamie Lynn. Thanks. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, we are hoping to, I forgot to click one special button to share my sound. But um, as he had said, we had, I have two producers that I had interviewed and um, I guess surprisingly, it's, or maybe not, but uh, we have Russell's brother, CJ Blue, as our first guest. Um, talking about some conversion of crop ground into annual forages. So, Mr. Blue, can you give us an overview of your operation? Yeah, so we're in a family partnership, blue partnership, um, with my younger brother, Russell, my wife and three kids, and I. Um, we're primarily a, or our commercial cow-calf operation. We have, um, also have uh, components of stalker and backgrounding. We stock, we, we do our own background, our own cattle. We do feed some cattle on the ranch, but uh, for the most part, everything is retained ownership through a commercial feed yard. Um, we are primarily in Reno and Barber counties in Kansas, um, so South Central Kansas, um, and we have everything from irrigated perennial grass that we graze. Um, we have uh, annual forage crops on traditional cropland that we graze from that all the way to native range. And then when we get into Barber County, native range that probably resembles New Mexico a little more in the Jip Hills than what it would in Kansas. So our cattle have to be adaptable and that's, you know, they'll go anywhere on any part of the country that we have. Um, spring calving herd. Um, and like I said, everything from kind of native grass where they're, those cows are what we call grass and cake cows. They never leave the range. Um, those cows stay there and we wean the calves and, and get back around and weaned in Reno County. Um, the cattle that are maybe on your more traditional six month grass and then cattle that graze on, on uh, cover crops on cropland. So in you guys' history of the land that you've had through here, um, you converted quite a bit of crop ground into a forage system. What made you decide to do that? <clears throat> Well, I think whenever we made the conversion from, um, you know, from growing grain to more of a forage, more of a forage system, um, interestingly, it was economic. I mean, even today with $7 corn, it might make you think twice about growing forages and running it through cattle. But at the same time, historically, where we've been in terms of just the net margin we could net growing crops, um, you know, the, the cows were a better option for us. We, the, the cattle deal was working better for us. We had been a commercial cow-calf operation all along, and we were hell-bent on being farmers, too. And so it was it was an easy switch for us because we were already in the cattle business. Um, along with that, I think all the ancillary benefits that we've seen from that um, have been, obviously, been good as well. But for us, it was just a side benefit. But you look at the the environmental impact that we've had, um, sustainability, things that we can talk about. I mean, just from an environmental stewardship perspective, we've made significant progress. Um, and so those are things that we can start to focus on now where, not that we couldn't do that before growing crops, but it was just a little more of a challenge. Uh, we've been able to take on our, on our crop acres and um, with, with the advent of, you know, doing forages and grazing, grazing cattle on them, um, we've been able to essentially remove um, all but a little bit of nitrogen. Um, we've removed herbicides. We've taken phosphorus and potassium out of the equation. So not that any of those are bad things. It's just that we, we can we can have, a, I think, a, more of a significant impact on what our environmental footprint is uh, with the switch to cattle. So I think it's been a kind of a double-edged sword or, or a win-win in, in multiple aspects. But the initial decision to do it was, was, was simply economics. I mean, we were looking at how to make money with the land base we had. And so we had already done quite a bit, quite a bit of cover crops. <clears throat> Our history on the cropland was we had gone through the transition of, of no-till from conventional till to no-till in the, um, late, you know, late nineties, early two thousands. Um, we had implemented cover crops over that period of time as well. And so, 
that's kind of where we were at. I mean, we were using cover crops and, and no tilling and using precision ag and trying to do everything we could. Um, but at some point we just the economics were to the point where it made sense for us to run cattle on on those crop acres and so we do everything from annual forages uh, where we stockpile our a summer, a summer annual forage um, a, a blend that we have there's legumes and, and grasses both in there we stockpile that um, and then graze that uh, strip graze that through the uh, fall and winter months um, and we also have some winter cereals that we grow in a blend with legumes as well um, and graze and also do a little bit what little bit of harvest and forage that we do have for feed comes from that as well um, and then we have perennial uh, grasses and we have um, irrigated bermuda we have irrigated uh, cool season um, perennial grass blend and then we also are doing some uh, cool season grass on dry land as well and when you are making your transition what were your thought process behind selecting what to place on your different pieces of property? Because you do have dry land and you've got some irrigated yeah. as well. <clears throat> so, I, I, well, multi-factors. So you're right. I mean, the difference between irrigated and dry land will affect the blend that we use. And we've, we've done, it's been an interesting journey. I think anybody that grows cover crops would, you know, if they've done the same thing twice, then they're probably doing something wrong anyway. So, we, you know, we've, we've continued to do you know with the annuals obviously we're continuously tweaking that um, but a lot of it just is whatever our goals were for the specific grazing window and what, you know for instance I mean what we like about the cool season perennial grass is number one we don't have to we don't have to plant it um, but it also just widens out our window we've got a longer period of, of green growing forage at that point um, and then like on the stockpiled uh, summer annual stuff that we grow and let go dormant obviously you know, we we have a different goal in mind with that than we would if we were growing it or grazing it during the growing season. We know that we're going to let that go dormant and stockpile. And, and so there's different species in that that we've tweaked over the years that, that seem to work better for that. And so I guess my answer to your question would just be it depends on, I mean, there's multiple scenarios that we have for multiple species that we're growing. And it just depends on what our goal is and when we're going to graze it and what we're going to use it for. And how do you think the irrigation option has helped you be successful? <laughs> well, well, anytime you can make it rain, it's a good thing. Um, the the uh, I, I will say this. I mean, so so from the irrigation the irrigated perspective, you know, in Kansas, for the most part, it depends on how old or new, you know, when you're what uh, vintage your permit is. But in our area, anyway, for the most part, we're at one and a half acre feet or eighteen inches of water per season. Um, interestingly, you know, we and I'm sure at some point we're going to use our 18 inches of water. We're going to get into a dry year where we use our 18 inches. Um, historically, on our corn and soybean crops, even uh, in the dry, you know, in the driest years, obviously you, you were at the 18 inches and had to shut off and you, your crop suffered from it. And then in some years that were more normal, you still use the 18 inches. Uh, so we have that kind of history. If you compare that to the perennial grass of today, um, so far, since we've established these, we've gone anywhere from half to, to two-thirds of our water usage. So we've actually cut our water usage back. Like I said, we know at some point we're going to use the, you know, we're going to need the 18 inches of water, but we actually think that we're using less water, um, or we know we're using less water. We also, because the growing season is longer than it is for corn or soybean crops, um, what we've done is we've, we've quit watering during the day so we're watering at night when we're more efficient um, you know, we're not concerned about like with a corn crop during pollination where you've got to keep the water on it continuously to keep up um, like I said it's extended period so we know that we can water in the evening water at night when it's cooler um, and you have less evaporation and so um, that's kind of how we've managed our irrigation but I'm not answering your question about how it made it easier. I think, and I would just say, just just the fact that we can, you know, we can have that tool in the toolbox, um, and not all of Rakers irrigate it, obviously. So, the other thing that I think it does is it gives us a little bit of uh, a cushion for, you know, to help us manage drought. Over, if you look at everything as a whole and the acres that we manage, you know, our acre base as a whole, um, it, it gives us a little bit of insurance against drought, and so you know we utilize it that way and use it as a cushion for that as well. 
And uh, speaking of that cushion, do you think having both the perennials and the annuals is a good management option for for that cushion perspective? Yeah, I think um, I think to have the option, you know, and and you know the growing season. And, and having to where you don't have all your eggs in one basket, so your growing seasons don't all completely line up on everything, is it's just diversity. I think it's a good risk management um, approach to have that, um, to have those different blends grown. Um, I mean, not only from a diversity and a blend perspective, but just, you know, different growing seasons and being able to maximize those with your, you know, through grazing. Um, I was going to say something else, but well, it slipped my mind. And my final question to you, what advice would you give someone looking to convert crop ground into a forage system? Well, I think the, the, um, I think the cattle are imperative. And, and so whether, you know, when you say a forage system, even if we're looking at a traditional crop acre that you're going to grow a cover crop, you know, in between your cash crop, um, the closer we can get back to what this this uh, land was before man laid eyes on it. In other words, this grassland that we have and th th this this was all um, has all evolved over eons of time with with grazing animals, foraging animals, um, with periodic you know wildfires that would burn it. And um, the closer we can get back to that, the better we are in my mind. And so. Even in a traditional cropping system where we're growing cover crops, I think we need I think we need cattle on it. So I think that would be, you know, if you're not going to figure out a way to get cattle on it, then um, then I think you're missing, you know, you're missing the boat. And I say cattle, I, it, it's any you know any any grazing animal you can get on. Um, so I, I think that would be first and foremost. The other thing is just, you know, trying to, you know, one of the challenges I think is is just trying to sort through some of the noise and and get the right people on the team to help you uh, figure out what what you need to grow because there's all kinds of options and like I said that you know we we continue to tweak our our annual cover crop blend that we use so um, that can I think that would be um, something you want to work on a lot is trying to figure out you know what what mix do I need um, and diversity is key you know we've seen a lot of good from having diversity out there so that would be some of the two or, you know, two or three things top of mind that I would tell somebody. That was right, our that's... producer. And, uh, you know, Mark had said this is uh, Eastern Kansas. Well, to me, Barber, uh, 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 you know, Reno County is kind of more central, but uh, this, this was a one of the two producers that I had. And so I've got a Southern section producer and then one who is uh, mostly dry land uh, a little bit later. So Mark, you wanna go ahead and do the next introduction while I change videos? You bet. Uh, again, thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, Forney. Uh, it, you know, I think we're gonna hold questions for a little bit here until we get through the second section and uh, part two in this third section uh, involves the incorporation a, a little bit more of cover crop grazing. Uh, by Greg Gehring uh, of Gehring Farms. Uh, I know uh, CJ mentioned they do a little bit of that. We're going to hear now from Greg Gehring and Gehring Farms. So again, I'll turn this back over to you, Jamie Lynn. Thanks so much. And uh, Greg, he is in McPherson County. I don't remember if we've mentioned that in the video. Can you give us a little bit of information about your operation? Well, I, our operation here is we're generally um, a cow-calf operation that uh, we've got some commercial cows, uh, we've got some purebred, we do semi, some charlay, uh, a little bit of Angus, uh, Mains, Maine Anjou. Uh, basically what we do is like we just kind of like to run those cows a lot of them were old show heifers from my daughter taylor and uh, we basically uh, put embryos in and then our commercials carry the they act as recips and so um 
we do that and we farm uh, mainly corn, soybeans, and, and wheat, and a little bit of milo. Um, and that's kind of our operation. I mean, it's very diversified. Uh, and we don't have a lot of irrigation. 95% of what we have is dry land. And as you've been looking into expansion of your cow herd or changes in some of your managerial practices, what made you interested in putting cover crops on some of your crop ground? Well, I tell you, I, I got to thinking, I mean, more, more and more people were talking about cover crops and that type of stuff. And, and really what drove me to this was trying to figure out a way um, that we could keep a cow herd sizable, you know, a couple hundred cows. Um, and we just don't have access to grass. Uh, you know, we rent some pastures, but we wanted, I wanted something to where, you know, it's, it's almost cost effective or not cost effective to go out and try and buy some of this pasture that's extremely expensive. So what could I do with what I had, um, that could be considered grain as well as livestock compatible. And that's why um, got to thinking, got to talking, saying, hey, what can we do? Um, and uh, basically asked for help from the extension. <laughs> and um, you've, how many years have you been working on integration of cover crops or annual forages for your cattle production? Um, on a small scale here at home, just maybe like 80 acres we were playing around with for the last four or five years, just a little bit. Um, in fact, the area that we're standing in, but then bigger scale is across the road uh, where we're doing more in, um, you know, like crabgrass and that type of stuff mixed in with forges and that type, you know, that, that blend uh and then uh that's just been really two years that we went in on that hundred and or that full quarter 160 acres over there um that that's the one that we really want to make right you know so just two years and this year we're we're getting our water tank set up um trying to to make it more efficient and with what we want to do uh, we have the benefit from here you know from the home place to uh, where the grass is that really we can go almost a mile and a half and it's we can move cattle back and forth which is makes it really nice on two different areas and different forages and you'd mentioned about the water and uh, where you're putting in some permanent water sources. Yes. Are you pretty committed to trying and keeping some annual forages as a uh, normal production management system for you? Yeah, that's one thing. I mean, I, you know, that uh, I think you've got to be committed uh, for just to be sustainable like that. And, and we, here's my commitment. After doing one summer of hauling water every day, <laughs> in the heat of the day, uh, and sometimes twice a day, but we were hauling water last summer every day, and uh, I was like, we're, we're, we drilled a well, um, we got good water, uh, I, I'm really happy the way it turned out, and yeah, we're putting in uh, rubber water, you know, cattle water tanks, and so um, I think we're going to have some uh, opportunity to do different things because we've we've basically set that up that we can have a quadrant here quadrant there and every every way that we set it up there's water available for the cows as you're looking into your selection for what you're pu putting out to plant how do you determine what plant species are out there <laughs> well <laughs> uh basically uh what works or what i try and do is what's working in within the rotation of what we you know like we had wheat so what goes good behind wheat um a lot of times i ask well last year i mean your guidance jamie lynn uh, your guidance and and uh you know ron and some of these guys that are have more experience in different 
forages gave me a lot of ideas of what I wanted to do. They asked me kind of what do you want, what do you want to do grain wise? I mean, what do you want to do? What is your next crop rotation? And then gave me ideas uh, for that. What we'd like to do is in the summertime, maybe like a, what I'm standing in here is like a uh, um, BMR sedan grass. Uh, and, and, and then maybe we could turn it into like if we had row crop out there where we have milo stalks or corn stalks and that type of stuff. So that's kind of what, you know, what's right. Uh, it, it's a learning process. Uh, right now we've got some we, we last year and this year we use crabgrass after wheat and or that was growing there and uh works really good and then we've planted we actually planted the bmr in part of that last year just like this but the crabgrass actually got real aggressive and overtook it <laughs> so we ended up having crabgrass and hopefully and the, the you know this just didn't keep up fast enough so yeah and so if you're wanting to visit with somebody or if somebody came up and asked you for the, your biggest learning advice, what would you say you, if, if they're looking to put in annuals in their system? The, is, is the biggest curve that I've got to, that, or that I'm fighting is what mix and what, what works in my area. Um, what is the best mix and and go with it um you know not necessarily do, am i looking at it to be what's the least expensive i want to do what's best and that would last and stay you know for a long period of time um right now for us we can plant wheat take the wheat crop off have crabgrass and and that that works nice but that's going to play out so the biggest learning curve is what forages to put out there that work with what we want to do because the goal is it, for my goal is what how can we make it a grain slash forage situation where we can benefit from both or can we you know can we actually benefit from both i think we can it's just finding the right mix that's the curve that i'm got to learn Yep, balance in all things. <laughs> balance in all things. Yes. Uh, what have been some benefits or surprises you've seen with incorporating some annuals into your system? Well, the, the biggest, as far as the biggest benefit, I think, is um, last year um, we had lost a pasture. So with that in there, um, we, we had, we had a hundred, a hundred pair and they were there all summer. I mean, they were there from, um, I want to say May, um, May 1st or so, uh, there was only one portion of that field that we ended up cutting, uh, for wheat was maybe 40 acres, but the rest of it, they sustained all of those animals till September. And that was beautiful because we had all that feed. Um, I mean, we literally just let them go. I mean, we moved them from one pin to the other and that was the benefit. Um, from an economic standpoint, do you think the diversification of the cattle and the cropping systems is worth it? I do. Um, is it right? Is it wrong? I don't know, but uh, what I'm trying to do economically is I want to keep my livestock. I like I like it. Uh, it it gives me joy, uh, and at the same time, I'm utilizing a piece of ground or farm ground that you know. Can I raise grain and feed cows or? It may turn into, I may find out that the best thing I can do is turn that whole thing into just forages and not worry about the grain. But right now, uh, in the infancy of what we're trying to educate ourselves and other people, I'm going to, I think the money's well spent uh, because it's right here. I can have a piece of ground because what do we do in production agriculture is all times is try and figure out how this piece of ground can make us the most income or the most profitability 
if I can do two things with one and figure out that down the road, hey, okay, the grain and the grass didn't work, but I can keep it for cows, perfect. I've, I've, I've met my goal. And with help and education, I mean, it never hurts to ask. And the whole reason why I wanted to do this, because I'm sure there's other people out there, there's other producers out there that say, well, what were, are, you know, is anybody doing this? Well, if we can help somebody else figure out a piece of ground that can do that, and I think it's economically, it might have saved me because I didn't have to pay expensive rent or find pasture somewhere else. I made my own. So thank you very much to my two producers who decided to participate in this. Um, I thought they, they both brought up some similar comments and discussions, but they also had two different goals and objectives within their operation. So thank you for, thank you, CJ, and thank you, Greg. And Greg is, was able to join us today. Unfortunately, CJ had a prior commitment. Uh, Jamie, thank you so much. Did you say Greg is able to join us today? Yes, sir. He, awesome. he just un, uh, gave him, put his video on, so. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and I'll tell you, during, during that last clip, uh, it, it, both of the clips were great. Uh, I really appreciate it. I checked the map. You're absolutely right. Reno and McPherson County are in central Kansas. So uh, that was good. Thanks so much. Uh, I tell you what, do we have any questions? And I know, you know, uh, Russell is all on also, uh, Russell Blue. So is there any questions for Dr. Farney, for Greg, for Russell uh, about these last two sections? I do have one question that came in. I know we're short on time, um, but the one question that has come in is what is suggested to plant as a forage? I'll let Jamie Lynn, <laughs> you're the expert, Jamie Lynn, that's why I ask you all the time. So yes, I'll have her refer to that. That is a loaded question. And, um, you know, we, we had to cut out some of Greg's because he he had learned some things that didn't quite work. Um, you know, one of those things like uh, TEF, and that was a one that we thought would be a wonderful forage. Um, he learned that you can't just turn out on the TEF, that, you know, you need to hay it and then graze it. And um, so, you know, it's very, very dependent on your operational objectives. And that's what I love about these annual forages is you can, you can come up with what's gonna work based on your environment, your goals and your safety level for you know, how much you wanna deal with nitrate or prussic acid concerns or you know, hairy bed toxicosis. Uh, there are quite a few really good tools out there, and one of them that I like to use a lot is the Midwest Cover Crop Council decision tool that you can pick your county here in Kansas, your goals and objectives. So if you're wanting to do like what Greg is doing, try and, you know, be both a grain crop and cattle producer, you can say, okay, I want something that's going to help with organic matter, but also is a good forage. And you put those and it generates a populates a list of plants that K-State experts have said we think would meet X objective. But then you still need to go and visit with your local people. Or, you know, if you drive by somebody's field, your neighbor's field, ask them. You know, like Greg had said, he said, we're trying to help each other and educate everybody. So yeah, that was an extension answer. It depends, <laughs> but hopefully we gave you, you know, at least some tools. Thank you, Jim and Lynn. Hey, uh, I, I know time is short, but uh, I tell you what, uh, we'll check for any more questions, but, but Jim and Lynn, Greg, again, Russell, any comments, you know, uh, like I say, we, we've had the two videos, they were great. After watching those, any other comments you wanna kind of leave the group? Uh, things that maybe we didn't touch on, things that you wanna uh, reiterate? I guess, I guess for me, I mean, I just, I'm thankful for the opportunity to do this. I, it was kind of like something 
on my mind. Um, I had to laugh at, at parts of my video. Um, I can tell you that I guess the one thing is that there's no right or wrong. Um, I just want everybody to know that if you have an idea, don't hesitate to reach out to our, our experts that are extension and whatever, just with ideas. Um, I can't tell you how important it is to, to ask um, what we're doing. I'm not saying is the way everybody has to do it because we're still in the infancy stages. And so what I'm, what I was just want everybody to know that don't, don't hesitate, call me, call, call all the people that are um, on here. Um, the extension people have all kinds of data and that kind of stuff. And I think uh, there's more people out there that have reached out to me and say, what works, what doesn't. And I, a lot of people have this question in their head. So I just want everybody to know that if they have an idea, take a start small, start with a small piece of ground or whatever, but um, it, it, it can, it's a lot of fun. It really is. I just like the education part of it because I learn every day. Everybody else does too. So that's all I got. Uh, I do want to re-add uh, another thing. You know, NRCS guys are another great resource. Uh, CJ, he was telling me that they work really a lot, especially on their perennial pasture decisions, what to plant. Uh, Doug Spencer has been out there several times working with them. So uh, use, use all the resources you can get a hold of. Some awesome advice, uh, awesome, awesome presentations. I really appreciate it. Uh, I, I suppose like I say, we probably need to be trying to wrap this thing up. I, I want everyone to note all of these videos, uh, some as extended versions, will be posted on the Ag Summit webpage located under the Feed and Forge section. Uh, please go there in a week or so at least uh, and view those videos uh, in their entirety and, and share the link with your friends and your neighbors. Uh, uh, with that, uh, again, I wanna thank all of our, our presenters, all of the folks who brought up questions, and all of you uh, who, who tuned in today. Uh, and I'll turn things over to Kim Nettleton, our state head reporter. Kim. Thanks so much, Mark. And I want to say thank you to everyone that helped out on these videos, uh, especially Ron, Ted, Joe, Doug, Dusty, Direct, Russell. Uh, Jamie Lynn, uh, CJ, and Greg, uh, as well as the folks behind the scenes. Now, if you can hang on just for a few more minutes, uh, we've got one little piece of business we've got to finish, uh, and that is to help identify going forward uh, the top priorities in the feed and forage sector by taking a poll. Um, we're going to uh, bring a poll up here. Uh, these are priorities that have been previously identified in the past in past sessions and don't forget you can to scroll down because there's there's uh, more than what you can see at first. Uh, but these options you're, you're to pick your top three uh, priorities for the industry um, reduce restrictions on hang and grazing and fertilizing CRP fields enhanced risk management options for forages implementation of action items for uh, the vision of the future of water supply in Kansas, additional K-State research and extension forage personnel, increased funding for research in Kansas related to issues pertinent to alfalfa feed and forage growers, simplified permitting requirements for farm vehicles and transportation, uh, forage sorghum representation on the National Sorghum Board. Uh, and then lastly, at the bottom, there's an other category um, and please, you can go ahead and click that one. If there's other items or other issues that are more important to you than these that are, you see on the screen, I would ask that you would write those in to your, into the chat at the bottom. Uh, just tell us what your, what your, you think your issues are, your top issues, and um, we'll give you a couple of minutes to fill out that poll. Kim and Robin, uh, while everyone's kind of completing that poll, could I give one more shameless plug for the uh, 2022 American Forage and Grassland Conference? Uh, it's Absolutely. going to be held in Wichita, Kansas, January 9th through the 12th, uh, 2022. 
please mark your calendars. Again, uh, you know, we're going to have experts there, not just from Kansas, but from across the United States with workshop sections, including winter feeding management, grazing cover crops and residues, rep, uh, regenerative grazing, and soil health and carbon sequestration in grazing land. So I really think there's going to be something there for every forage grower in Kansas. Uh, and so, again, uh, thank you all for being here today. Thank you so much, uh, Kim and Robin, uh, for what you did to put these things together. And uh, once you kind of wrap this up here with the, the poll, uh, I'll let uh, Robin kind of finish things up. But again, I just want to thank you guys. This has been awesome, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, participate. I'm also going to jump in here with a, a shameless plug for the Kansas this Forage and Grassland Council, um, I would really encourage everyone to go check out their website. Uh, and I would also encourage you, of course, to join, uh, be a member uh, if that if the mood strikes you. So uh, with that, Robin, are we done with the poll? And she'll show us the results here. Yep, we'll go ahead and end the poll and you'll be able to see the results here. Uh, I'm not seeing them, Robin. There they are. All right. So it looks like um, number one, increased funding for research uh, pertaining to alfalfa and feed and forage and additional uh, personnel, K-State and extension personnel, definitely. And then it looks like our third uh, is enhanced risk management options for forages. So uh, once again, I want to thank you all very much. Thanks, everybody, for hanging around and taking the poll. And Robin has uh, just uh, one more uh, little message for you, and we will be done for the day. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you, Kim. Yes, before we close out this session, I have just a couple of things. Um, let me get my screen shared here. All right, so we just wanted to thank you again for your participation in the Feed and Forage session today. Uh, just a reminder that this session was recorded um, and will be posted along with the other videos that we played today um, at our website, which is www.agriculture.ks.gov slash summit. And those will be posted here within the next week. So we hope you are planning to join us in Manhattan um, on August 26th for the Agro Summit event. You can register for that event on the same uh, event website as well. And the last thing before we go is we wanted to highlight that this is the second year for the Kansas Department of Agriculture's Ag Heroes program. And we would like to encourage everyone to submit nominations of any individual, family, or business in Kansas agriculture that you feel provided a notable contribution to the agriculture industry or in their community as a whole. And the nomination period is currently open and will close on August 13th. The nomination instructions can be found at that same website www.agriculture.ks.gov summit. So thank you again for participating and have a great rest of your day.